just carrying on as normal, okay? So in this lecture, we're going to go through some of the free vibration analysis that you're going to need for your lab report and for other things as well, okay? And what I'm going to do in this lecture is I'm going to, first of all, give you this information about log decrement. And then, because this is quite a short segment of information, I'm then going to give you some advice on uh, the lab, okay? Because some of you are starting to do the lab now, and, and many people have questions and uncertainties about what to write in the lab report. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time in this lecture going through some of the information about the lab. Okay, but we're going to start with logarithmic decrement. Okay, so in the last lecture, we, um, we derived an equation for the free vibration of a mass spring system. So this is the, what we call the free vibration equation. Okay, so this is quite a long expression, but it's this thing about x of t being equal to exponential e to the minus c to omega nt. And then we're multiplying that by the initial displacement, x0, times cos omega d times t. And then we've got x dot zero plus zeta omega n x zero over omega d, and that's all time by sine omega dt. Okay, so that's what we went through. We went through the derivation for this expression, didn't we? And we said that essentially this is an exponential multiplied by, uh, well, we can turn the sine plus the cos into either a sine or a cos, so that's our next step, okay? So this is like a sine wave or a cos wave multiplied by an exponential. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next. So we're going to say this can be written as so it's a slightly simpler form, x of t is equal to the same exponential term but now that bracket is going to be equal to cosine, sorry, uh, so there's a big x to go out the front here, big x e to the minus zeta omega nt cosine omega dt minus phi. So, so what we've done is we've combined, in a minute I'll show you how what the expression is, but we've combined the constants in front of the sine and the cos into one term which we're going to call big X for now. I'll, I'll, I'll write down what big X is in a minute. Okay, and we've used the, um, the trig identities. Okay, so there's trig identities which turn cos of something and sine of something, you can put them together into cos of something minus a phase angle. Okay, so this, this cos and sine thing here goes to cos of something, the same thing, minus a phase angle, okay? So this is a standard thing in trig formulas. And so the big X is equal to the square root of X naught squared plus, and then this, so these are the coefficients of the sine and cos. So normally when you see this written in the trig identities, this is like if you have A times cos plus B times sine of something, okay, the new big coefficient X becomes the square root of A squared plus B squared. Okay, so that's that's the normal way it's written down. That's why I've just given that. Okay, so, so that's if you... So just to note, in this equation, this is A, and this bit here is B. Okay, so they're, they're the coefficients of the sine and the cos. And also, this new phase angle we've introduced, phi, is equal to arctan of minus b over a. Okay, so you can convince yourself of this using trig identities if you want to.
but in essence it means that if you look at our expression for x of t, it's, it's a coefficient x times an exponential times a cosine wave. Okay? And we know from what we did last time that it, it looks something like this. So if we have a, a time t against x of t, then we have something which is oscillating like this, which is kind of decaying as it... Okay, so it's, it's like a cosine wave, although there's an arbitrary start because there's an offset due to phi now. Okay, so phi means that the, the start isn't perfectly at a maximum. And then it's, it's decaying in amplitude as time increases. Okay, so, and what we're going to do now is we're going to look more clear, closely at what's happening here. We're going to define this distance here, this first peak, we're going to call that x1. Okay, because that's our first point where there's a peak, and then there's another second peak here. We're going to call that one x2. Okay, and the corresponding times are going to be t1 and t2. Hopefully that's logical. So t1 and t2. And then the time distance, or the the time between T1 and T2 we're going to call tau D for now. Okay, so we'll just call that tau D. Okay, and the, and the subscript D is there to remind us that this is a damped um, vibration problem. Okay, so quite often this, you remember subscript D was omega D was the damped natural frequency. Okay, so this distance between these two points is the time period of the oscillation, but we've got a little d there just to remind us that it's a damped oscillation. So now we're going to take the ratio of the successive peaks. So if we, for example, we take x1 over x2, well, what we can do is we can we can use the formula that we've got for x1 or for x to, to have a solution for x1 and for x2. So what does that mean? It means that x1 is equal to big X e to the minus zeta omega n t1 cosine omega d t1 minus phi. Okay, so what it means is I put time t1 into the equation of motion, and then that will give me the displacement at, at x1. Okay, because x1 happens at time t1, doesn't it? Okay, so it's just a relationship between the two variables. And so the same for, t for x2. So I've still got big X e to the minus zeta omega n. And now I've got t2, okay, and then I've got cosine omega d t2 minus phi here. But we know also that these were taken at the peak values, and at the peak values, the cosine is going to be 1, isn't it? Okay? Because I'm, well, the positive peak values I'm taking here. Okay? So actually, these two things are going to be uh, equal to 1, and x over x divides out, doesn't it? Okay? So what we end up with is just the exponential terms 1 divided by the other. And there's a special relationship for exponential terms because of the relationship with log laws, okay? So this, an exponential divided by an exponential, we can actually write that as uh, like this. Okay? Because we can take the inverse of the bottom exponential and multiply it by the top exponential. And we make, let's make a note, say, because cos equals 1 at peak. Okay, just to remind us where the, the cosines have gone to. Come on. If 
I switched freeze on, have I? So, so what have we got in terms of this T1 minus T2? T, uh, sorry, T2. We've got a relationship. We know that we know that tau d is equal to T2 minus T1, isn't it? So, T1 minus T2 is equal to minus tau d. So finally, we have that x1 over x2 is equal to e to the zeta omega n tau d. Okay, because we've replaced t1 minus t2 with minus tau d, which gets rid of the minus sign in front of the zeta. And also... Also, we know something about the period, time period tau d, relation to its frequency. Okay, so we know that um, we can say also that the time period, the damped time period tau d is equal to 2 pi over the damped circular frequency omega d. Okay, that's just the relationship between frequency and time period. And we know from what we did last time that omega d is this damped natural frequency is equal to the undamped natural frequency times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared, isn't it? That's what we did in our last lecture. So tau d is actually equal to 2 pi over omega n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. So now we're nearly we're nearly there with some of, with this definition. If we if we take this e expression up here, we take the log of each side of it, okay? We'll get log of x1 over x2 is equal to zeta omega n tau d on the right hand side won't we okay and we're going to call that a new expression we're going to call that delta so let's first say take the natural logarithm of uh, of the ratio we're going to bring in a new piece of notation so we're going to call delta equal to the natural log log to base E, or ln, if you want to call it that, of x1 over x2. Okay, so, and take the log of the right-hand side, that's equal to zeta omega n tau d, is equal to zeta omega n 2 pi over omega n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. So we, got, we can cancel the omega n here, can't we? So this equals zeta 2 pi over the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. And this new thing, delta, is the logarithmic decrement. So what it means is that we can estimate, so we can take a free vibration test, which is what you'll do in the lab, a 
Okay, and we can look at the different heights of the peaks, and from that we can get some information about what zeta is. Okay, so zeta, remember, is the non-dimensional damping ratio of the system. Okay, so it tells us one of the key properties about the system. And all we have to do is just record the free decay of the system and look at these amplitudes and measure their relative difference to each other. Okay? And as I say, that's something that you'll do in the laboratory class. Another key simplification to this is that when the damping is small, so zeta much less than 1, you can approximate the logarithmic decrement as equal to 2 pi zeta. Okay? And this becomes quite an important piece of information, in, particularly in exams or problem sheets. Okay? So very often, you're asked to find the, the logarithmic decrement, of, or find the damping or relating to the logarithmic decrement of something. And if the damping is small, then you can immediately just do it with this simpler equation. Okay, whereas you can see that the other equation, okay, zeta appears twice. Okay, so you've got a slightly more complicated thing to do. You've got to multiply this out and solve a quadratic and stuff. Okay. Whereas if zeta is very small, it's only going to modify that, that square root term by a very small amount. Okay, so we can approximate it as, as equal to 2 pi. Uh, delta equals 2 pi omega. 2 pi zeta, sorry. However, when you're doing your experiment, as you know, there'll be potentially experimental error, won't they? So if you just take two peaks, it's like taking a little snapshot. Whereas if you take many peaks, okay, you should be able to average out the experimental error, okay, by taking many, many peaks. Okay, so to get an accurate estimate, need to take many cycles okay so we'll do a little bit of analysis to show how that works so delta is constant So, uh, just, you know this already because you're in your second year, but when lecturers stand up in front of you and say things like delta is a constant, okay, you know now to be cautious, don't you? Because what, it, what we really mean is that delta is assumed to be a constant, okay? And so when you do the laboratory class, what you might observe is that actually your, you know, the exponential doesn't exactly fit for your data, okay? We're assuming it fits, okay? It's a very convenient model to use and generally it seems to get the right answer okay but you always need to be cautious about these kind of assumptions so this is an assumption that delta is constant because if it's constant then we can take the natural log of any set of successive peaks so let's say we start at zero this time so we go x0 to x1 and that should be exactly equal to um, x1 to x2 and so on, as many times as we want to do this, okay? x to the n minus 1 over x to the n should be the same because we're assuming that the exponential decay happens exactly the same for any successive peaks in this thing which is diminishing down towards zero. Okay? So, over n cycles, so if we times we have n lots of delta, well, we can use the log laws okay, so if we take n lots of it, we can just add them all up, okay, so if we just add them up, we've got n of them, haven't we? Okay, so we, we add those up Sorry, we don't need log laws for that. We need log laws for the next bit. So log laws tell us that log of A plus log of B is equal to 
to log AB, isn't it? Okay, so that's just the log law. So if we put, if we apply that, then we'll end up with um, we'll end up with things like this. We'll have x0 over x1, x1 over x2, and so on. Okay, so these things cancel out. Okay, so we'll end up essentially with an expression. We can write delta as one over n log to the e x0 over xn. And if you think about it, what this is saying is it's saying fit the exponential between the first point and the, and the nth point, between 0 and n if you like. Okay, fit the exponential curve, but take into account of the fact that it's n cycles long. Instead of just being one cycle long, which we did before, now it's n cycles long. Now, when we very often in vibration problems, we're interested in very lightly damped systems. Okay, so we want this, with the systems we're interested in have small damping, and that means that the decay takes a really long time to happen. Okay, so this thing might be going backwards and forwards with very, very light damping. And so sometimes counting cycles is really tedious and difficult, okay? So what you want to do is maybe you want to just record the time between two points and then try and work that out, okay? So there's another way of um, using time instead. So using time instead of cycles, we know that delta is equal to two zeta, sorry, is equal to zeta omega n tau d. So we can say that n delta is equal to zeta omega n, not m, n times two d tau d. So again, this is like saying, if I take, if I want n times delta, I take n time periods. Okay, so we're going to bracket and put n times the time period. And we're going to call n times td equal to t subscript drop. Okay, so that's going to be the time taken from the amplitude is at the start to the end to drop down to its final amplitude. Okay, so it's called T drop. And we're going to write so we can write N delta is equal to zeta omega N T drop. We know that's equal to log e x0 over xn, so the, first, the log of the first point to the last point. So we can get an estimation of zeta directly by saying log e x0 to xn divided by omega nt drop. Let's just sketch what more, imagine what this is doing. So this is T0. This is Tn. We've got something which is X0 here. Okay, and then the envelope is going down here. We have Xn. Okay, and so this, this is filled with lots of oscillations like this. Okay. So 
So there's kind of so many oscillations in there that it's, it's very difficult to count them all. Okay, so we, we're going from T0 to Tn. And of course, this time is T drop. This is useful for light damping. <coughs> so light, in, again, this is a phrase that people use very often. They say light damping. It means, it means uh, zeta very, very small. Okay, so small damping, light damping, uh, and co common expressions that people mean for this. So what sort of values are we talking about? Well, um, quite common to have values of 0 0.01, okay? If you're talking about MEM systems, it can be 100 times less than that, okay? And in, if people are now looking at nanostructures and the vibrations associated with MEM, um, nanostructures, and again, it gets orders of magnitude smaller again. So MEMS and nano uh, machines and um, devices have started to uh, reignite some of the interest in very, very lightly damped structures. You also get a lot of uh, very light damping in space structures as well, um, because they're operating, first of all, they have to be very lightweight, but they're also op op operating in near zero gravity conditions, okay, so you get very light damped structures there as well. Thank you. 